Chapter 64 Stubbs' Supper Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour upon hour, hour after hour upon that inert, sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all, except at long intervals. Good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along as if laden with pig lead in bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing near we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way to, into the cabin and did not come forward again until morning. Though when overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had advanced his customary activity, to call it so. Yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction or impatience or despair seemingly working in him, as if the sight of the dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought from the sound on the Pequod's deck that all hands were preparing to cast anchor into the deep. For heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But these clanking links, the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored. Tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels, and, seen through the darkness of night which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seem yoked together like colossal bullocks whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. A little item may, well, may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold with the ship upon the whale when moored alongside is by the flukes or tail, and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins. Its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small, strong line is prepared with a wooden float on its outer end and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management of the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mast, so that now having girdled the whale, the chain is readily made to follow suit and being slipped along the body, is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of the junction with its broad flukes or lobes. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle he was that he said that the staid Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of the affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat of an intemperately fond of whale as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, a steak, ere I sleep, you, Dagoo, overboard you go, and cut me off one from his small. Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not, as a general thing, and according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before realizing the proceeds from the voyage, yet now and then you will find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale des designated by Stubb, comprising the temper tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil. Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. 
Mingling their mumblings with their own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharpened, sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side, you would see them just before, as before you had heard, heard them, wallowing in the sullen black waters and turning over on their backs as they scooped out lo huge globular pieces of the whale, the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How at such an un apparently unassailable surface they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls remains part of the universal problem of all things. The mark they thus leave on the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter and countersinking for a screw. Though amid the smoking horror and diabolicism of the sea fight, Sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every man, every killed man that is tossed to them. And though, while valiant butchers over the deck table are thus capably carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat, and though were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing. That is to say, a shocking sharkish business enough for all parties. And though sharks are also the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, systemically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances may be set down touching the set items, set terms, places, and occasions, when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers and in gayer, more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale, moored by night to a whale ship at sea. If you have seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But, as yet, Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own Epicurean lips. "'Cook! Cook! Where's that old fleece?' he cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper." and at the same time darting his fork into the dish as if stabbing with his lance. Cook, you cook, sail this way, cook. The old black, not in very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at the most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley. For, like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they call him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubbs' sideboard, when, with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head, so as to bring his best ear into play. Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth. Don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good, a whale, shark, a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks over at the side, ne over the side, don't you see that they prefer it tough and rare what a shindy they are kicking up go cook go talk to them and tell them they are welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation but they must keep quiet blast me if i can hear my own voice away cook and deliver my message here take this lantern snatching one from the sideboard now then go and preach to them Sullenly looking after the, sullenly taking the offered lantern, Old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks, and then, with one hand dropping his light load over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs and, leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice, 
began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, I was ordered here to say that to you that you must stop that damn noise there. You hear? Stop that damn smacking of the lips. Massa Stubb says that you that can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchlings, but by gore you must stop that damn racket. Cook here interrupted. Hook here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook, why damn your eyes, you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, Cook, go on, go on. Well then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax him into it. Try that, and Fle Fleece continued. Do y'all is sharks, and by your nature very wordacious. Yet I say to you fellow critters that the worships is top that the slapping of the tail. You think the here suppose that you keep the damn slapping and biting there. Cook cried Stubb, collaring him. I won't have that swearing. Talk to them gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your raciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much. That is nature and can't be helped. But to be gobbering that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is sharks, sartin. But if you gobbin the shark in you, why didn't you be an angel? For an angel is nothing more than a shark well gobbered. Now, look there, brethren, just that wants to be civil. Helping yourselves to that whale. Don't be tearing the blubber out of your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark dude right as totter to that whale? And by gore, none of you has done right to that whale, and that whale belonged to someone else. I know some of you has a very bright mouth, bigger than others, but then the mouth sometimes has the small bellies, so that bigness of the mouth is not to swallow with, but to bit off the blubber for the small fry of the sharks that can't get the scrounge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. Them damn Willems will keep a scouging and slapping each other. Master Stubb, they don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn guttons, as you call them, till this belly is full and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get some full, don't they hear you then? For then they sink in the sea and go fast asleep on the coral and can't hear nothing at all no more. Forever and ever. Upon my soul, I am about of the same opinion, so give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cust, fellow critters, kick up the damnedest row you ever can. Fill your damn bellies till they bust, then die. Now cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. Just stand where you stood before, there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All detention, said Fleece again, stooping over upon his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely, meanwhile, I shall no go back to the subject of this stake. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? What that to do with the take, said the old black testily. Silence, how old are you, Cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And have you lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, Cook, and don't know how to cook a whale steak? Rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so the morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, Cook? Hind the hatchway in the ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But what I know when is what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say Roanoke country, he said sharply. No, you didn't, Cook, but I'll tell you what, I, what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Breast my soul if I cook another one, he growled, and angrily turning round to depart. Come back here. Cook, I hear. Hand me those tongs. Now take off that bit of steak there and tell me if you think that steak is cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cook take I ever taste. Juicy, berry juicy. Cook, said Stubbs, squaring himself once more, do you belong to the church? Passed one once in a cape down, said the old man sullenly. And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtlessly overheard a holy person addressing his hearers. 
as his beloved fellow creatures. Have you, Cook, and yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, said Stubb. Where do you expect to go, Cook? To bed very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast, teeve too. I mean, when you die, Cook, it's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the Negro, slowly changing his whole air and demeanor, he himself won't go nowhere, but some breasted angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they did fetch Elijah, and fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongue straight over his head and keeping it there solemnly. So then you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece again in the sulks. You sat up there, didn't you? Now look yourself and see where those tongs are pointing. Perhaps you expect to go to heaven by crawling through the lover's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but must be done or else it's no go. But some of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders. Do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand and clap the other on top of your heart while I'm giving you my orders, Cook. What? That's your heart there? That's your gizzard. Aloft, aloft. That's it. Now you have it. Hold it there and pay attention. All attention, said the old black with both hands placed as desired, vainly rigging wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it. Do you hear? And now tomorrow, Cook, when we're cutting the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of the fin and have them put in a pickle. As for the ends of the fluke, have them soused, Cook, and there you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Holla, stop. Make a bow before you go. Avast heaving. Whale balls for breakfast. Don't forget. Wish by gore whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm pressed if he ain't more of a shark than master shark himself, muttered the old man, limping away. And which, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Now Stubb is being really rude, mean, terrible here. Um, He's, you know... Here he is. He makes the cook get out of bed in the middle of the night just to cook him up a whale steak. The same whale he's planning to eat tomorrow and probably the next day. And he's having part of it pickled. So he is going to be eating at this thing for a long, long time. And, you know, here he is. He makes fun of the guy. He says, oh, go tell the sharks to stop making noise. I mean, that's like a stupid request. And here you have the cook who's old. I mean, he's old, old. 90, and nobody gets to be 90. Well, not nobody gets to be 90. But very few people get to be 90. And so here you have this old man who's the cook, who's relatively poor and unlearned, and Stubb is just making fun of him, probably because he doesn't like the way he cooked the steak. And the guy thinks the steak is cooked perfectly. And there's all sorts of opinions about how steak should be cooked. And I'm guessing there are opinions about how whale steak should be cooked. But some people like steak rare, bloody rare. Some people like steak well done, where it's just like solid brown all the way through. And... Um, People have different opinions of this. And one time I went to um, went to a Japanese steakhouse where they cook the steak right in front of you. So they have this big flat iron grill and the chef in the middle and he spins the knives and uh, 
spins the knives and spatulas and does all sorts of fancy things with, you know, takes an onion, takes a, takes a slice of an onion about yay thick, and he splits it apart so that, you know, you have each of the onion rings. But he takes the rings and he stacks them back up. So you have the biggest ring with the next littler ring stacked on top of it. Because it goes up like this, the smaller ring fits on top of the bigger ring. And it doesn't like fall off the sides or fall in because they know how thick to cut it anyway. So it stacks it up. So you have this tall cone and he squirts a little, uh, I'm not sure, liquid down in there. Uh, maybe sake, maybe, you know, I'm probably, maybe alcohol. Actually, yeah, it's alcohol of some sort because he then lights it. So you have this flaming volcano of onion. Anyway, Japanese steakhouse, I digressed. And, you know, so the person who's cooking goes around and asks how everybody wants their steak. And uh, we were, family was there and there was another couple there. And a uh, person asked me how I liked my steak and I said rare. And the chef threw down the steak, flipped it over, and then held it out to me with a spatula. Now, it's just like down, over, and handed out to me. Now, the thing is, is that the top of the steak wasn't actually completely cooked. So, you know, you had these brown spots from where it hit. But you had this streak of purple where this had never made contact with the grill. And because the steak was down on the grill so fast, it didn't have time to, like, cook through radiation or convection through the steak. And so I held out my plate. It's like, okay. And the person who was with the other couple, she just turned white. I mean, all of the color drained out of her face because she had ordered it well done. And um, just too much. The first, the person who was cooking was like, okay, this is a joke that went the wrong way because I was happy to eat rare steak, raw rare steak. Rare. Oh, yes, your lolly mentioned Pittsburgh rare. Now, in my opinion, and a number of others, the best way to eat steak is something called Pittsburgh rare. And in order to cook it, you have to have a really hot fire, really hot grill. And so it's often done with cast iron and um, done with cast iron and it's done it's often done with cast iron because that's really the best way to get a good high heat. And what you do is you get the iron really like smoking hot and you throw down the steak and then you flip it pretty much like the way the guy served it to me, except, you know, you let the surfaces get completely cooked. And what happens is, is you get this wonderful caramelization of the proteins and you have this you have the really great flavor that you can get from the grill marks or from the outer portion of the well-done steak where it's where you have all of the taste of the cooked steak. But in the middle, it's like blue rare. It's almost uncooked and it's pretty much raw. And so you have the flavors that you get from the cooked steak and the flavors that you get from the raw steak. And they're mixed together, and it just tastes so good. But most places don't know how to do it. And it's called Pittsburgh Rare, because it was started in Pittsburgh with uh, steel workers. And what they would do is they'd take torches, and they would heat up a piece of sheet metal, throw down the steak, flip it over. And if you do it wrong, you end up with a medium rare steak. If you do it really wrong, you end up with, like, overcooked cooked beyond well done and it it can go really bad really fast but if you do it right it's done really well my dad. what my dad your dad, my dad liked it that way. i his dad liked it that way so lolly's lolly's dad your great great your great great grandfather Great grandfather, sorry, your great grandfather liked it that way, and it's a excellent way to have 
excellent way to have steak. Um, but a lot of places can't do it. A lot of places don't know about it. Um, another thing, they talked about lashing the ship to the whale and the whale to the ship. And they... The thing is, is that they're lashed head to tail. The bow of the ship is the tail of the whale. And the head of the whale is the stern of the ship. So that you have the kind of uh, yin-yang shape. Where you have the one head to the other. The other is tail. So it's like, you know, the two fish chasing each other in the Pisces logo. Or you have the yin-yang symbol with the black and the white in circles. Uh, so there's that. So it's the head's hooked up. And they talked about the sharks coming. Now, sharks are infamous for being able to smell blood. A little bit of blood in the water and sharks from all over come around to get the food. Um, so they're like vultures in that way. It's like they smell it from miles and miles off and they just go to it. And they talk about how, you know, whales will follow fishing vessels. They'll follow whatever, hoping to get an easy snack. But they're happiest around whaling boats. Because, I mean, if you're to think about it, a whaling boat at night, they can't process the whale in the dark. So what do they do? They just tie it up. And so here you have 12 hours of darkness well, I guess in this case, you know, they have six hours of darkness because it's midnight at this point when the sharks come along. But you have 12, six to 12 hours of darkness where the sharks have full access to the whale. They don't have to hunt it down. They don't have to chase it. They just like walk up to the whale like an all you can eat buffet and they just start chomping on it. So this is the end of chapter 63.